What if I told you that this could disappear completely in the next few years? That's right. And no, I'm not just talking about euro. I mean that all cash could vanish from our current economic system. That's right. You heard what I said. But pay attention because that in itself is not the most surprising thing. The most surprising thing is that although it seems crazy, some economists think that eliminating cash would be a very good formula for economies around the world to work perfectly. What's more, it is no longer just a matter for economists, but even several governments around the world have already begun to take steps in this direction. You don't believe me? Take a look at this news. China, getting closer and closer to completely eliminating cash. China nears fully cashless economy. Sweden is on track to be the first society to do away with cash. Let's be clear, cash has become a nuisance. I'm talking about the fact that cash has become a real nuisance for politicians around the world. As you can imagine, if the government wants to get rid of cash completely, it is in large part to fight the underground economy. An underground economy that, as we saw in a previous video, could be causing OECD governments to lose between 1 and 2% of their GDP each year. Now, whether we like or dislike the existence of the shadow economy, as we just told you at the beginning of this video, there is a Another big reason why the governments of the world would like to eliminate cash. A reason why many economists suggest that it could be a great idea to improve the development of a country's economy. But the question is, how on earth could a cashless society prosper more economically than one with cash? Is it feasible to leave an entire country without cash, or is this more a daydream of the politicians in power? And to take it further, are there other advantages and disadvantages that could arise from this measure? Well, if you want to know the answer to all of these questions today on Visual Economic, we're going to to tell you. So let's get cracking. Here's a question. Can you tell me who this man is? Yes, I know he looks like the new CEO of Alibaba, or maybe just Jackie Chan's long-lost cousin, but no, nothing here could be further from the truth. Although it is hard to imagine, this man you see on the screen is called Zen Li Yi Gon, and he is, in actual fact, a real Mexican drug lord. In 2007, the Chinese-born kingpin was arrested in his Mexico City mansion for allegedly selling chemicals to drug cartels. Let's say that Zen Li Yi Gon would be to Mexican drugs what Taiwan is to you. US processors. Be that as it may, what is important is that when he was arrested in his large mansion, the cops found a whopping $200 million hidden in cash. As some of you can imagine, it is in the interest of criminals to pay and get paid in cash. This is because it is the most convenient way to keep their activities in the shadows. They could also use diamonds, gold, or try to sell their products with hidden crypto servers, but you will agree with me that cash is the easiest solution of all. Without going any further, I'm sure many of you have seen the CV series Breaking Bad. In that series, the protagonist is dedicated to manufacturing methamphetamine, which he sells through a network of distributors who sell the drug in exchange for cash. However, there comes a moment in the series when the protagonist accumulates so much cash that he has to find a way to officialize it in order to use it. And what is the best way to legalize all of that money? Well, start a new fake local business like a fake car wash or a fake cab company, which by the way, was one of Pablo Escobar's businesses. The accounts are then falsified and it is declared that more money has been earned than has actually been earned. Extra money that is the perfect cover to justify the authorities the legal provenance of all that drug money. Be that as it may, and now that we are talking about local businesses, let me ask you another question. Would you be able to tell me who tends to have an easier time collecting cash and avoiding filling the taxes that are due to them? To give you an idea, according to a study by the European Commission, self-employed workers leave between 10% and 43% of their registered income undeclared. What's more, according to the same study, tax evasion by the self-employed is causing a loss of revenue for the government of up to 1.6% of GDP. And do you think that the politicians of the day are happy to lose a good chunk of their income? I'm telling you, no. Paying more than 1,000 euros in cash has a fine. How much and who pays it? As you can see, both tax fraud and the fight against drug trafficking are the excuses politicians always use to attack cash. But the truth is that, as we have said, there is another reason why it's proposed to eliminate cash. The economic reason, which is just the one that ultimately interests us the most in this video. So let's cut to the chase. Why do some economists want to eliminate cash? And how do you explain that a cashless society would be able to make its economy prosper? better. Well, let's find out. A matter of type. 
What would you say if I told you that the terrible Great Depression could have lasted less time if there had been no cash floating around? I know it sounds strange, but it turns out that there are economists who believe that if negative interest rates could have been set at that time, the magnitude of the crisis would have been much smaller. But let's slow down here. What do interest rates have to do with it? What does it mean that they should have been negative? And more importantly, how do they relate to cash? Don't worry, we'll explain everything. Imagine that due to economic fear, a stock market crash, or simply something like an aging population, more and more people stop consuming and investing in new businesses and start saving money for the future. Returning to the case of aging, this could happen if a large number of people start saving to pay for their retirement or, for example, to leave inheritances to their kids. In any case, what would be the consequences if this were to happen? What would happen if everyone suddenly started saving. Well, at first glance, what would happen is that in order to save money, many people would stop spending money. So there would be fewer customers in the bars, less investment, and fewer new businesses would get started. However, this doesn't really have to happen. And this is where the fundamental role of banks comes in. Banks are what is known as financial intermediaries. Intermediaries take all that money from people who want to save and lend it to people who want to spend or who want to invest in new businesses. In other words, savers give up spending money in the present so that other people will spend it for them. In return, they will receive their money back in the future plus additional compensation, a compensation known as the interest rate. Now, what happens if a lot of people put their money in banks at the same time and the banks have no one to lend that much money to? Does it just sit around gathering dust in a safe? No. What happens in this case is that banks lower the interest rate at which they lend. Thanks to that, more people are encouraged to invest, to buy a house or a car, and in short, to continue with the economic cycle. And keep in mind that there is a golden rule of stability here. All the money that is saved end up being lent, and therefore that money is always kept circulating. However, there is one big exception to all this, the exception of the lower bound on interest rates. What is this lower bound problem? What this lower bound problem means is that interest rates cannot go down forever. There comes a point where if too many people save, in order for the banks to be able to place all that money, the golden rule of stability is broken. So interest rates have to become negative. In other words, savers have to start paying commissions for their deposits in the bank. And now I'm sure many of you here are already beginning to see the problem. By having to pay for having savings in the bank, many people will prefer to simply keep a safe deposit box or under their mattress, and then that way they don't have to pay any commissions. By keeping your money in a safe and not in the bank, then the money you save is no longer lent to other people. And bang, the golden rule is broken. Just at that moment, when people start holding their money in cash, all that money leaves the system. In other words, interest rates can no longer fall, there is less money to invest, to spend, or to buy a home. Which, as you can imagine, means that many businesses make less money. Some will have to close, others will have to start lowering their prices in order to keep selling, and ultimately, if the volume of savings after the effect of lower bound is too high, then a demand crisis will occur, accompanied by a potential deflationary spiral, which is just what happened in the Great Depression. Looking at this, many of you will be reminded of the videos we made about Switzerland and Japan, countries that are closely related to the zero boundary problem. However, knowing this, there will be one question that many of you are still wondering. How could the disappearance of cash solve this major problem? Well, as we have mentioned before, if interest rates become very negative, people would start hoarding cash. But if cash is eliminated and the money is converted into, for example, a digital currency that cannot be kept at home, then the savings could be placed in lower and negative interest rates. A possible digital currency that explains news items like this one. The European Central Bank has released a new working paper as part of its 24-month Central Bank Digital Currency project. The paper focuses on the technical aspects of a potential digital euro and examines digital economy pain points, including financial intermediation, payment options, and privacy. Given this, I can already sense what you are thinking. Doesn't this negative interest rate thing sound a bit artificial? Isn't it a bit incompatible that people are willing to keep their money in the bank even if they have to face a negative interest rate? Not really. Negative rates are the results of a world full of people wanting to save and and very few people wanting to invest and consume. Imagine, for example, that you live in a world where prices go down 5% every year. Surely if every year you lose 2% of your money due to the negative interest rates, since everything is 5% cheaper, it would still be worth saving your money because at the end of the day, you would still have more purchasing power. In short, the 0% limit is nothing more than a floor set by the existence of cash, something inherent in the way that monetary systems work and not so much a fundamental economic issue. But stop, let's put on the brakes for just one second. If eliminating cash was such a good idea, why hasn't any country in the world taken the plunge yet? Do you think that maybe there's a 
catch in all this. Indeed, no idea is free of adverse consequences, and right now, let's take a closer look at them. Arguments against. In Venezuela, the de facto dollarization of its economy took place in 2019. After a major blackout that left practically the entire South American country without electricity, Venezuelans were left with no means of payment with which to continue their economic activity. Without electricity, ATM, payment terminals, or practically any other possibility were obviously not working. And that is not all. By the time the Bolivar had already lost so much value that transporting enough cash to make a purchase was physically impossible. Therefore, citizens had to resort to the use of the dollar to carry out transactions. Something that, by the way, even my managed to cool down the exorbitant inflation that the country was suffering from. Fortunately, Venezuela was a country that was already used to having the dollar as its backup currency. But in a world where only digital money existed, not having electricity could be a big problem. To some extent, the digital currency proposals include certain mechanisms to overcome small power outages, even multi-day outages. But imagine a country at war, suffering a natural calamity, or exposed to a constant computer attacks. It would be, at the very least, a rather complicated matter. Be that as it may, the apparent security problem in a cashless world would not be the only one. As you are aware, cash is anonymous. And just as anonymity facilitates crime, it also prevents governments, especially the more authoritarian ones, from poking their noses into our affairs, our money, and our families. And although, to be fair, the European Central Bank seeks to create a digital currency with some guaranteed privacy, the truth is that, according to them, this privacy will never be 100%. Full anonymity is not a viable option from a public policy perspective. It would raise concerns about the digital euro potentially being used for illicit purposes. On the other hand, there is probably the biggest drawback to the feasibility of the end of cash. There is a large population group that would be very, very affected by all of this. As you can see in this image, sorted by age, the percentage of people who consider cash to be their preferred method of payment is much higher among those over 64 years of age. And even if young people show high rates of cash issues due to lack of banking habits, it would be very complicated to accelerate the transition to digital cash without leaving behind many seniors who are not used to digital payments. Besides, what can I say? Having very negative interest rates would mean that many people who do not want to see their savings decrease, or at least decrease nominally, would have to invest in other financial assets such as stocks, housing, or even government bonds. In other words, families could be forced to assume higher levels of risk, a risk for which they may not be prepared. Not to mention the culture shock. Imagine trying to tell grown adults who all their lives have been accustomed to 10 euros today equaling 10 euros tomorrow that that's not the case. Maybe it's going to be a massive shock to the system, a culture shock that would cause a great political inconvenience or even economic bubbles. In other words, if tomorrow you tell the population that every year they are going to lose a percentage of their savings in the bank, perhaps they'll be more determined than ever to buy houses or shares to protect themselves. Although this is mere speculation as to what could happen. In any case, let me tell you that in reality, even if the ECB is determined to make us cashless, perhaps all of its objectives, or at least the anti-crime objectives, could be solved without having to eliminate cash all at once. Take a look at this. Currently, of all the cash in circulation in the European Union, banknotes of 50 euros and upwards account for more than 90% of the total value. And if we consider the 100, 200, and 500 euro banknotes, the proportion is almost 50%. Now think about it. How many people do you know who usually carry such banknotes in their wallets? As it turns out, a first step to eliminating cash without leaving anyone out could be to withdraw the larger bills from circulation. That is what Harvard economist Ken Rogoff proposes. According to him, if you eliminate the largest banknotes and leave, for example, the fives and ten banknotes and coins, it would already be very harmful to criminal activities. What's more, this would allow exploring the world of negative interest rates because there would be many more people willing to leave their money in the bank instead of filling their house with coins and small five euro bills. There would be a middle ground between the advantages and disadvantages of this measure, a plan of action on which economists, politicians and ordinary people could agree. Of course, in this case, the option of the people on the ground, that is all of you, may be the most important in the end. So you can now let us know what you think about all of this in the comments. How would you propose withdrawing cash from circulation? Do the potential advantages of this system outweigh the disadvantages? What other positives or negatives do you see to this measure being explored by the world's institutions? You can leave us your answers in the comments below. And remember that you can highlight your contributions with the thank you button. And by doing so, we'll also be able to financially support all of the independent media that is us here at Visual Economic. If you like this, video, please like it so we know. Activate the little bell button down there so you don't miss any of our videos and all the best and I'll see you next time.